China is empowered economically in part because we're addicted to very cheap goods. Um, and, and we didn't hold China either to its, you know, certain promises that it was supposed to keep um, when it joined the World Trade Organization. We kind of let China have its way with the world. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kissin. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest is returning for her second time on the show. She is the New York editor of Spectator USA, Melissa Chen. Welcome back to the show. Hi, Constantine. Hi, Francis. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's so good to have you back. Listen, uh, we talked to you last time, I think it was about September 2019. We talked primarily about China, the way it's using its power in the world, the impact that the CCP is having on all of us wherever we live. Well, uh, one or two things have happened since then that have made that even more uh, a thing that is present in our lives. Talk to us about what you've seen over the last year and a half. I mean, needless to say, at the time that we were taping it, it was not on anyone's radar, really, unless you were a China watcher or, you know, really focused on geopolitics. Um, But, you know, somewhere around October 2019, things were already brewing in Wuhan on the ground. And our lives were about to be completely upended in ways that, you know, we just couldn't anticipate. Um, And when 2020 hit, everything hit the fan and... You know, it's been a a really interesting year. Coronavirus has kind of accelerated so much of of the trends. So, you know, almost every trend that we've seen, um, whether it's uh, in in work, you know, working from home, whether it's on globalization, uh, supply chain sovereignty, or even just the concern about China and China's role in the world, all these trends have really been kind of accelerated or at least brought to the forefront in, in the last in the last year or so, um, and and China's action since then has has really not been that of a responsible world actor, um, and so stuff that I was talking about in in 2019 to both of you um, has really become relevant in, in a way that in 2020 made me seem like you know I, I was some sort of like a, a, a psychic or something, but but the trends were already there, and and the signs were already there, and and you know sev- I would say like several people you know, in, even in the Trump administration, had already acted in ways to, to counter China's increasing assertiveness. Um, but, but look at, you know, bipartisan agreement on China right now. Look at popular opinion in, in, in America. I think uh, 90% of people um, in America actually agree that China is, is a competitor and a rival. It is not you know, a partner to the United States. It's, it, we, we're not going to be able to develop and get rich together. We are actually geostrategic rivals. Um, and so all these have really kind of shifted in the last year. Um, and it's a very profound, like, paradigm shift. And you say it's a very profound paradigm shift. And we've seen, you know, what's happened with the coronavirus. I mean, how much responsibility should China take for this? Well, I mean, it's really interesting because, you know, we're talking at a time now when the whole lab leak hypothesis has mm-hmm. been, you know, sort of shored up again. And so it's it's percolating in the press, um, something that was completely apparently a debunked conspiracy for the last year, um, you know, since early Early on, I would say in January, February, there were people talking about this. What are the odds that you know, in the city where there were two, not not just one, there were actually two labs um, that housed BL4 facilities uh, studying these bat coronaviruses would be the 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 source or, or the, the first place where COVID-19 shows up, um, the virus SARS-CoV-2. And, it, you know, Oakham's razor, which is really, you know, a, a very basic principle of parsimony that that the scientific method uh, is is modeled on um, really should have been at play, right? Because what is the most obvious uh, guess here? And in, instead of kind of investigating this possible theory as a hypothesis alongside others, which was, you know, the reigning theory of the day was really about the zoonotic transmission at the Huanan seafood market from bats to some sort of mystery animal, which was surmised to be a pangolin. Um, in the end, 
you know, we reflexively, the scientific community, governments, and our entire media class dismiss the lab leak hypothesis as some sort of, um, you know, racist or, or just debunked conspiracy. We shouldn't even go there. Um, and, and really it's, it's, it's a failure on, you know, what Eric Weinstein would call our uh, sort of uh, communal sense-making apparatus. Um, the institutions that run on media really decided on gating this narrative and, and preventing people from asking questions. If you happen to, you know, zero hedge early on was banned from Twitter um, and all over Facebook was banning, you know, anyone that was posting or removing mm. posts um, that even suggested it might have been a lab leak. And, and you know, even without the lab leak, even if, if, if this, you know, China was found to be to be lying. I, I, I think that um, if you look back at the initial cover up, enough damage had been done. Um, how we, you know, the, the country persecuted the um, whistleblowers and how it tried to kind of hamstring the investigations. I mean, on what planet does, you know, the, the, the country that the pandemic started in gets to pick who gets to sit on the so-called independent inquiry that the WHO sent. One year after the entire incident happened, more than one year actually, and, and also after scrubbing the alleged crime of the scene, which was supposedly the, the seafood market, which we know from interviews you know, where um, the, the vendors did not actually sell any of the meats in question, whether it was pangolin, or bat. So there were there are just so many questions, and China's behavior ever since um, ever since the the pandemic broke out has just been um, just very very suspect and and retaliating against any country like Australia that um, was suggesting merely for an independent inquiry. And Melissa, I'm going to jump in there because as you were listing off all the different meat, I I, I was worried about Francis getting hungry. Um, I am. <laughs> but uh, listen, I, I there's another aspect to all of this which I find really interesting, which is neither you or us were particularly huge fans of Donald Trump, but how much of the failure to react adequately, failure to investigate properly, failure to take the appropriate action in the circumstances was simply about the fact that people hated Donald Trump so much that when he said we actually need to shut the border to Chinese people coming from China because that's where the virus is originated from, uh, when he said uh, th we need to investigate whether this was man-made in a lab, etc. When all of these attempts were being made, kind of the mainstream saw it through the lens of Donald Trump and therefore failed to take action as a result. Whereas now, many of the things that he was saying at the time, uh, particularly about the origin of the virus, calling it the China virus, closing borders, this is something actually the left is now demanding. Yeah, it's... 80 to 90 percent. Um, the reason why I think, you know, we've um, kind of dropped the ball on this or that the press has, because if, if you if you look at how how a lot of the, the press frames these stories, anything that, you know, we're now judging whether a policy or, or, or whether something is true based on who is saying it. And, and this this phenomenon has really been exposed during the last four years during the Trump administration, where where if something is going to help or or, or hurt the uh, Trump administration, it you know that's when the press decides to upregulate or downregulate the story, um, and and they decide the framing. So when when Trump you know went hard on China, um, the press saw this as an opportunity to present it as Trump abdicating his culpability, which. To be fair to him, um, you know, I think initially he had the right instincts to shut the border, but but he wavered on sort of um, later on kind of, you know, either downplaying the, the, the virus or or saying ridiculous things during the, the press conference. It didn't really help. Um, he wasn't a, a, a excellent kind of like public health crisis kind of leader. Um, and, 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 you know, he's not good at science communication either. He's probably, I mean, there were many comical moments during, you know, the, the press conferences. But on the other hand, his instincts on, on many of these uh, initial steps were right. Um, it played to his kind of uh, his biases to to you know be sh to be a bit more restrictive on on immigration and shutting down borders, and so you know he got excoriated in the press. And you saw this remarkable thing, which I still think you know I, I refuse to to let the press memory hold this. 
But people flipped, right? So initially, the Republicans were, were, were reacting very strongly. This is serious. We need to shut the borders. Uh, you had Navarro and Trump kind of insisting on this. Um, uh, and, and they were banning flights from Europe. And I remember, you know, these images at the airport, they were all shown on TV and it was chaos. And of course, the press was saying this was just racist. I think Joe Biden also said it was actually xenophobic. Um, and and then you had this remarkable switch later on when, you know, it, the Trump administration realized also that shutting down lockdowns would actually hurt the economy. And the one thing that gets incumbents reelected is always a good economy. And, and so they started flipping their position. And, and now, you know, the, the lockdown party became the Democrats and they wanted to uh, to basically shut the borders. And, and I mean, look at today, Joe Biden's instinct was to shut down uh, the moment there was this nasty variant that was going on in India was to actually shut down travel from India, um, you know, an act that was so-called racist just one year ago. Mm-hmm. And, and so you see this ridiculous flipping, almost as if no one is holding any position based on principle. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just a sign of, of how this political divisiveness and partisanship is, is making governance during a public health crisis so completely sclerotic. It's a really good point, Mel. But, but isn't it also the problem as well, you know, th- that we've bought into this idea of the globalized world being a universal positive. You can get your goods from China. You can get this from India. But what coronavirus has actually shown is that the more interlinked we are, I mean, the more vulnerable we are as a society. Yeah, I mean, you know, that the nature of the virus doesn't respect any borders. And it's very progressive like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, and and, and the two things that really popped up was PPE, the issue of, you know, where our PPE was, were coming from. And initially, China was shoring up the supply, knowing that this was happening, knowing that uh, the West would actually have a harder time trying to react, given that most of the raw materials and the, you know, the manufacturing capacity was actually in China. And so there was this moment when, you know, we had a hard time trying to acquire these things, not to mention the confusion over communication on masks and their effectiveness at the beginning, which obviously has caused a lot of problems. Um, and later on, you know, when it came to vaccine raw materials, that's that's be- that's become another issue where, you know, uh, even the EU is 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 relooking at this issue because we've outsourced vaccine manufacturing to parts of Asia. And when, you know, this should all be seen as something that is part of, you know, national security, um, vaccines, PPE, in a world where pandemics can just kind of, um, you know, just spread like, like wildfire. Um, and well, if you look at also, you know, what happened uh, in the last, I would say in the last year is that the, the, sort of e-commerce platforms kind of grew bigger, right? So your mom and pop stores really suffered, but your Amazons of the world, they are the ones that not only survived, but, but they got their power, kind of their market power got, got far more entrenched. And, and it did get far more entrenched. Do you think we're going to see a, a reversion back to people wanting to shop local, buying American products, buying British products? Or do you think that when this crisis is over, we're just going to go revert back to the status quo? Um, I think there there are really two forces. You know, it's it's interesting because Joe Biden has not actually rolled back any of Trump's policies vis-a-vis China. Um, he, in fact, he's been kind of sticking to a, an America first policy that the press often excoriated Trump for 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 supporting. Um, and, you know, I mean, in fact, Biden's uh, uh, deputy spokesperson at the State Department said that, um, you know, when when we were thinking of of how to address the the crisis in India, the, the pandemic has been raging there, a second wave. Um, and he said, you know, the world has an interest in seeing Americans get vaccinated before before everybody else. And that was a response that you know that if this had come from Pompeo's State Department, that that would have been like a complete public outcry and meltdown over this terrible America first policy. But quietly, America First has been rolled forward. We are taking care of, um, you know, our supply chains, our um, our needs first, and and it's just interesting that you know when this administration is doing it, it's it's not receiving the same kind of pushback as as the previous one. Um, and and I think so many people have become aware of Chinese influence in you know in this open 
liberal society that we all live in. Um, that includes, you know, basically all throughout the West. The members of the EU have also kind of woken up to this and, you know, they're thinking of cutting back on their trade deals. Um, and, well, I, I just, to, to be honest, like the the American public has has kind of like woken up to China as, as a geopolitical threat. And I think, um, you know, given the bipartisan consensus too, that that likely moving forward, people are going to be a lot more careful about, you know, pushing back China, Chinese narratives in Hollywood, uh, Chinese influence in our universities, shutting down Confucius institutes and, and even products. So, you know, um, I think there is potentially a bill that's going to be advanced about um, whether or not a product is like to, to label products, where they come from. You start to see sanctions now on any products that might have slave labor, um, might have been, you know, parts of it might have been assembled in Xinjiang, which the United States under Pompeo and Secretary Blinken has declared as, you know, China has been committing genocide against the Uyghurs. So you're starting to see more legislative action and, and just more political will by people to say, no, enough. We've all woken up to, to the reality that it was such a terrible idea for us to engage with China for the last 40 years. Um, not only did they not liberalize, but, you know, we've become more like them. We've, we've, you know, their authoritarian model has, has been exported. Well, I was actually going to ask you about that very point, Melissa, because uh, I know you watched our interview with Neil Ferguson, the historian, I should say, not, not the epidemiologist. Uh, right. And what, this is one of the questions that I put to him, which is lockdowns, uh, he says have never been done before in this way and probably because we didn't have the technology to be able to, to stay at home, but also for other reasons. And really, we've imported that from China. Unfortunately, copying China is uh, a way of importing into free societies uh, the kind of software of, of the unfree society. I dread uh, to see any more articles of the form, we should learn from China, it's going to be the Chinese century, look how smart they are, because that's just an invitation to, to import totalitarian ways of doing things. Yes, in the past, in time of emergency, we have restricted civil liberties. We did it in both world wars, in quite drastically, actually. But everybody understood uh, in the world wars that it was a temporary state of emergency that would be ended as soon as the war was over. The problem with doing it in a pandemic is that it's quite easy to argue that, in fact, it's never going to be over because the virus will always be out there. And then, this is one of the typically totalitarian sounding slogans you hear. Uh, it, it, there, there's no, no safety. It's not over until, it's, until there are no cases at all anywhere in the world. Now, if you make that argument, you will be able to justify COVID restrictions forever. And I do think this has been an opportunity for a power grab by state bureaucracies. And I know that you're someone who cares about civil liberties a lot. How, you know, how do you feel about the fact that sort of like we look to an authoritarian communist dictatorship to decide what we do in our countries now? I think Neil, Neil's point was interesting because he said what we did in the West was kind of the worst of both worlds. He said that, you know, we, we didn't shut down and then we had this like almost lockdown in perpetuity with different weird codes. Um, you know, I, I think the problem is that you can't pick China's outcomes without China's system. And at the end of the day, you know, we don't have an, an, an oppressive surveillance totalitarian state. Not yet. Not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but we just we just don't. And, you know, if you compare the other kind of liberal democracies that did lock down very hard, um, I would say New Zealand and Australia are very good examples. Um, you know, is is it worth it in the end, uh, especially economically? These countries are you need to trade. They need their tourist dollars for, for their economy. Um, and it's impacting their you know economy in, in a way that we haven't really ascertained. I think we're not good at talking about trade offs. And, and in the sense that we are still living in this moment and living in the crisis, evaluating whether or not all these policies have been worth trade-offs. 
Um, I, I hate this narrative that, you know, every time you you try to criticize something like, you know, overhandedness by the authorities, you will get, oh, you're just trying to kill grandma. You just don't like, you know, oh, great, like two people are dead. Or it's 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 just such a terrible way to talk about, you know, on, on a macro level in society, whether a policy was worth it. Has it is it worth our kids being out of school for the last one year, more than a year now in some cities here in the United States? Um, it, you know, surely this is something that we've already known now. A year of of science and data have been collected, and and we know that this virus actually discriminates, and it is by age. Um, and so I think we're, we're starting to at least be in a position to, to look back and say, well, maybe maybe we shouldn't have done that. Um, but these are conversations that cannot happen in a place like China. You know, I mean, they're not allowed to have conversations like that. And hopefully this is something that we we can be honest, look back and, and learn from it. I'm just not very, you know, optimistic that that we will. Yeah. And I, I share your pessimism because I'm naturally pessimistic anyway and miserable. Francis, do you like biscuits? <laughs> Stupid question. If you like biscuits as much as him, you have to try Zingy Berry Bakery. They're a small family-run bakery that make award-winning sweet cookies and savory crackers. Francis will explain how many awards they've won, won't you, Francis? Their sumptuous cookies are made with whole grain oats and real butter, while their savory crackers are made with whole grain oats and are both wheat and dairy free. And they've got a brilliant offer. All you have to do is enter our code, which is of course triggered on your first order. And you'll not only get 10% off, they'll give you free delivery as well. That's 10% off and free delivery on your first order with our code, which is triggered. Go to zingaberrybakery.co.uk. The link is in the description. It's zingaberrybakery.co.uk and get your biscuits today. I think I've eaten too many biscuits. Never heard him say that before. Oh. Did, did it surprise you how malleable people were and how readily they were to give up civil liberties? Like in this country, the right to protest just evaporated and we all went, yeah, what's the problem? Oh, d depends on the kind of protest, right? Mm. So I think that was the, the, the hypocrisy was kind of aired out very openly when, um, you know, certain policies were, were applied very selectively and very, very hypocritically. Um, you know, things that were not OK under one circumstance were suddenly OK. And one of the effects of this is that I think the trust in our institutions have really crumbled. Like the last year has has seen trust in media crumble, trust in international organizations like the WHO crumble, the UN. Um, and, and partly it's because of this selective application, uh, you know, one side's narratives is favored, the other side's no, you can't protest, um, civil liberties for, for me, but not for thee, that kind of attitude. Um, and, and it's just, it's, it's been very destructive. And, and, you know, as society continues to evolve um, and the trust breaks down, I, I just don't really know how we're going to recover from that. So I'm a lot less, I know you ended that interview with, with Neil and on, on a very positive note because we've been in darker places before. Um, but I, I'm just, I don't, I can't see a way out for us. I mean, it's very, very succinctly put, which then begs the question, how do we roll back? Can we roll back? Or is this just a moment in time where it's been an, an unassailable rupture and there's no going back from it? Um, you know, I people seem to have um, a, a resiliency, mm. but I don't know how permanent these changes are. You know, you, you're starting to hear people are going back to work. They want to go back to work. They want to go back to the pub. We need our apolitical spaces back. Like we need sports back, but sports in a way that, you know, was uh, like before um, without all the politics kind of embedded in it and all the, the nonsense. Um, and, and I think it really depends on a lot of that, um, you know, whether we have these spaces to come together and 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 sort of interact in, in ways that the, the more uh, apolitical spaces and, and common hobbies that we can engage in, the, be the, the, the better the chance we have to, to kind of get back to the way things were. Um, but I'm kind of afraid that that ship has really sailed. Um, you know, the wool has kind of been pulled from, from the eyes of, of most people. The media has been, the media's hypocrisy has been laid bare. Um, you know, the idea that like 
silence is violence and, and sort of gaslighting about racial narratives and things like that have really been sort of inflamed um, in, the, in the last year. So I don't know if we're, we're going to be able to, to come back from something like that. And you mentioned President Biden. Uh, you mentioned that he's continuing many of the policies that Donald Trump had on China. Uh, are you optimistic that he's now that, as I said, the media is free to agree with him when he takes action on China, let's say, and other things, now that he has a bit more room for maneuver, he is certainly less uh, provocative with his language and the way he talks than Donald Trump, which was was, was never going to be a challenge to, to achieve. Uh, with all of that put together, do you think he will able be able to manage this problem effectively? You know, he's less provocative, but he has some blind spots, which I think helps China, um, especially in the arena of propaganda and soft power. Um, Biden, for example, in his first executive order, signed, um, you know, an anti-Asian hate crime bill. And a lot of this had been kind of posturing. And several Republicans in the Senate voted against the bill, not because they were anti you know, they, they, they supported hate crimes against Asians. Um, they voted against it because they were concerned about very broad language um, that might implicate, you know, people when they're talking about COVID-19 and things like talking about the origins of COVID-19 could be considered racially discriminated, uh, discriminating language and therefore, you know, be considered a hate incident. And so, you know, these kind of broad um, uh, overreaching language in and in tackling anti-Asian kind of racism has, I think, been a boon to 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 China because they know they can soften criticism abroad. Um, it's kind of like the same forces you see when when uh, people try to attenuate criticisms of Islam by saying that any criticism of Islam is Islamophobia. Mm. Um, and it's it's playing this like bigotry race card to to a very effective way to just silence criticism. And, and China's deploying it masterfully. Uh, my issue with Biden is really on this front where I think he is more amenable due to his political position. You know, he is a Democrat and I think he's more liable to that kind of uh, influence. The point you're talking about China deflecting criticism, it's the communist playbook. The Soviet Union did this exact thing. Uh, when America would criticize the Soviet Union, uh, my ancestors would reply saying, well, what about African-Americans in America having a rough time? And that was the deflection that justified gulags and all the rest mm. of it. Right. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very classic tactic. And uh, if, if you look at, you know, the wolf diplomats, um, we're very active on Twitter. These are Chinese, uh, you know, either um, ambassadors uh, or, or state media heads they are very aggressive in their rhetoric and very happy to point out and, and weigh in on U.S. domestic issues. They weigh in on the Capitol riots uh, on January 6th. They weighed in on um, George Floyd. They're using these domestic issues um, in a way to, to basically manipulate public opinion. And, and it's actually very, very effective. It is very effective. And we saw an example of soft power quite literally this week with John Cena. He was in what, Fast and the Furious 938 or something like that. And uh, he, he had to do a public apology. Right. And he did it in Mandarin and it was mm. posted on, on Chinese Twitter. It was so painful to watch. Um, you know, the, it, it's I, 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 I kind of made a tweet, a, a joke about it because his signature phrase has been this like hand wave where he's like, you can't see me. I'm like, yeah, like you can't see his balls. Like he just lost <laughs> his balls, um, you know, just just kowtowing like that in, in such a brazen way. Um, but you know, could you blame him? The, you know, the Chinese market has long exceeded for international box office sales, um, has long exceeded the U.S. market. So China now is an expert in just using its economic leverage, just bullying countries to to, to tow its its Communist Party line, whether the issue is Tibet, whether the issue is Taiwan or Hong Kong. Um, if it doesn't like what you're saying, if it doesn't like that you know, the website, whether it's NASA, whether it's Delta Airlines or Marriott listed Taiwan or Macau as a country and not a territory as part of China, it's able to use its economic muscle to just change that. Um, and and if you want access to the Chinese market, you, you have to buck up. You have to comply. If not, you're booted out. And, you know, tech companies 
uh, our tech companies at least have have made that stance. They are booted out. They are actually blocked from the Chinese market. Um, but but you know brands, consumer brands, like they they're liable. Like they they have to participate. If they don't, they they completely lose out globally. Mm. Melissa, I was going to ask you because we're having this conversation, and look, you know, I agree with you about. Uh, Chinese sort of soft power, what you might describe describe as soft aggression, influence, etc. But none, of, I don't think none of us, no, no one watching this, would want like another Cold War or a confrontation with China. But do you think essentially there is no way to deal with China without confronting them because there's no way to to get them to to behave as you you put it more responsibly. Well, I think decoupling was the way to do it. You know, the the Cold War, I mean, there's an argument to be had that the Cold War actually, we didn't win the Cold War, it didn't end. Um, China is the torchbearer. But but the analogy of the Cold War breaks down because we actually engaged with China um, economically. And we didn't do that with the USSR. You know, we let the USSR basically bleed out financially and it collapsed because of its imperialist adventures and and eventually was just financially unstable. Um, but that's not the case for China. You know, China is empowered economically in part because we're addicted to very cheap goods. Um, and, and we didn't hold China either to its, you know, certain promises that it was supposed to keep um, when it joined the World Trade Organization. We've kind of let China have its way with the world on its terms and, and not held it accountable for things like pillaging, you know, um, intellectual property, uh, corporate espionage, even these like massive cyber hacking um, sort of scandals, you know, stealing all the OPM data and things like that. So we just haven't really held China accountable to some sort of like international norms. We've let them have a pass because we just wanted to trade with them. And and in a way, we've really committed a, a terrible mistake. Um, it's not going to go the way of the USSR because we're now entangled economically. But there's still ways to, I think, decouple. Um, there, there are especially industries that we need to decouple for sure. So if you look at anything that um, that involves, say, like making parts for the electric grid, um, these are things that are implicated in our national security. To let China build our 5G networks, you know, that is why would you do that, right? <laughs> so, so there are ways to to at least uh, identify the industries that are crucial um, that are potentially, you know, kind of weak spots if we let China even contribute certain certain parts and, and decouple from, from that. And now we, we were talking about soft power grabs. Can you see in the next few years China making a hard power grab, maybe invading Taiwan? They've certainly had their eyes on it for a long time now. The uh, U.S. Navy estimates that the chances are that China would actually try to do that in the next seven years. Um, and that's good news. Yeah, it, you know, and it's one of those things like I think the U.S. appetite for intervention, military intervention after Afghanistan and after Iraq is pretty much zero. So I, I don't know how, you know, U.S. public opinion uh, would, would shape the the um, sort of capacity for our government to to do anything or the West to do anything in general. Um, but but an invasion of Taiwan is egregious. And if you don't stop China there, where would you stop? I mean, Taiwan is democratic. It's it's independent. It's been, you know, its own country for since 1949. Yes, it was a military dictatorship for a while, but it liberalized um, the nationalists liberalized in, in ways that makes Taiwan completely the most actually the most uh, vibrant liberal democracy in all of Asia was the first Asian country to actually um, introduce and, and allow marriage equality, gay marriage. So Taiwan is, is a beacon of, of, of freedom and a very important counterpoint to this narrative that, you know, Asians kind of uh, need a different system because they're culturally distinct. Uh, that's something that China has been repeating for a long time, uh, the CCP, that, uh, you know, Asian populations prefer collectivism uh, but the Taiwanese and and the Chinese have the same DNA, and they're they're separated by you know a body of water, but they have two different systems. Those two countries are thriving in different ways, and it's such an important counterpoint to China that it and and you know beyond the fact that China sees it as rightfully there, so the historical baggage, all the more makes China wants to reunify and take Taiwan by force. 
uh, Xi Jinping has said this. There, there's just like this is one of those issues that has like zero wiggle room for the current regime. And and if they take China, if they t- if China does take Taiwan, what's next? Japan is right there. You know, it's it's uh, a power in in the the Pacific area. You have Hawaii. It's really close to you know the the west coast of uh, the United States. So it's a direct military threat. And um, I, I mean, personally, I'm in favor of intervening. We have to intervene to do something if, if China ever takes, uh, ever takes Taiwan. I mean, you say that we have to intervene, but we haven't so far. We looked at the situation with Hong Kong. I mean, a couple of leaders came out. You know, Boris Johnson said something. I can't really remember it, but it was largely pointless. Can't you just see the West shrugging their shoulders again? Well, I think the problem with Hong Kong was the treaty that was signed. At the end of the day, you know, by 2047, Hong Kong was going to return to China no matter what. China just sped up the process and, and dishonored the agreement, did not grant 50 years of autonomy, one country, two systems to to Hong Kong. Um, and so it was really just a matter of like time. It just, you know, it did everything it was going to do in 2047, 20 years ahead of schedule. Um, in Taiwan's case, there would be a very egregious military um, intervention that China, you know, it, that there's no agreement with, with Taiwan. Actually, this is one of those ongoing conflicts that that just like Palestine and Israel that that have been, you know, since kind of the, the initial world order, really post World War II, it just hasn't been solved. And um, I, I, I just don't see I just don't see those those two things as as, as similar. Mm. Mm. Well, speaking of things being similar and not similar in Israel and Palestine, uh, have you been surprised uh, at the difference between the way, uh, you know, people who argue that uh, Muslim Palestinians are being oppressed by Israel uh, don't seem to be quite as upset about uh, yep. Uyghurs being uh, butchered and, and imprisoned by, Ch- uh, by the CCP? Has, has that surprised you, Melissa? You know, it's funny. I, I actually thought of that. I, it's not something I ever tweeted or um, or posted about, but that I, I got into an argument with uh, none other than Mia Khalifa, the uh, <laughs> Lebanese former porn star, an activist. And and I, you know, I, I remember thinking to myself, like, because oh, she's identifies as, as Muslim, and you know, why why is this such a a, a big cause? But but these, you know, Palestinian activists are just so silent on, on this one issue. And it's just so interesting how these issues map onto political tribes, because if you were consistent, if, if, if say, caring about Muslim oppression is something across the board that, that you know, is a principle you hold, surely you would speak up about something like that. And um, it's interesting because, you know, if you look at the, the, the signing of the, the UN, the letter to the United Nations, um, I think it was majority of the Muslim majority countries in the Gulf, in, in the Middle East, um, did not sign the letter. And that includes Pakistan um, to excoriate China for, for its uh, oppression of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And the reason, obviously, is because China is doing a lot of business and deals and is involved with uh, these countries um, in the, the Belt and Road Initiative where it's, you know, building infrastructure, giving loans. In the case of countries like Saudi Arabia, it's even exporting its its technology, you know, the panopticon that it built, the techno surveillance state technology that China is using. And so because of all these deals, I mean, if you if you look at how um, many of these countries look to China as a model, you have you have two options in the world. Either you are going to liberalize and become a liberal democracy um, or you're going to go down the, the China route and, and b- become an, author- an autocratic you know, uh, regime. And for many of these countries in the Middle East, they've, it's pretty clear which model they want to pursue. Uh, philosophically, they're far more aligned with the Chinese model, and China is paving the way. So, you know, they're going to just quieten their, their criticisms. And that is a good point. But it's also as well, China's model, let's be honest, is far more effective in many ways. There's not this constant turnover of leadership. You yeah. can get a hell of a lot done with slave labor. Exactly. No, this is some, I mean, I grew up in Singapore and, and on the scale from, you know, China to to the U.S., Singapore, somewhere in the middle. It's really kind of like this this interesting hybrid. And um, um, I've heard these arguments since I was a kid, you know, about um, the democracy is messy. Democracy is... 
um, you know, it, it leads to very slow, sclerotic, inefficient kinds of governments. Um, and, and something like the pandemic really threw this into very sharp focus, right? We saw how effective some of these authoritarian countries were in, um, in clamping down, in nailing people into their apartments, enforcing social distancing, uh, tracking. We can't even get vaccine passports because, you know, half our people will revolt. And, and I mean, I, when Bill de Blasio, you know, put out a number saying like, there's this hotline, um, all New Yorkers, if you see people not wearing the mask outside, not social distancing, call this number and report and snitch on your fellow New Yorkers. And people just saw that and they started sending him dick pics. And I was, <laughs> I was, I was so proud of, I was you know, like, oh, we're kind of screwed, but also very proud of America. I mean, on one hand, that's, you know, that's bad in terms of the outcomes for the virus, but I'd rather live in a place mm where people don't want to snitch on each other on each other rather than a place where there's just so much distrust and and that people are snitching on each other all the time but but the reality is that you know one of these places is going to do a lot better it's going to have zero deaths and it's again this kind of contrast goes all the way back to Benjamin Franklin the trade-off between security and liberty mm. it's a very good point and well made Melissa I think we'll leave China there for now. Hey KK, do you like feeling silky and smooth like a sexual dolphin? Never talk to me again. What if I told you that Manscaped have brought out a new and improved lawnmower 3.0 that allows you to be fresh and trim for the ladies down below? I'm married. The last time I was fresh and trim down below, Jimmy Savile was a respected children's entertainer. I'm going to ignore that. The lawnmower has a cutting edge ceramic blade which reduces the risk of having an accident where you least want an accident. My bank account. No, you idiot. You know, lost wear boss. Oh, right. Plus, it's waterproof, which means you can groom in the shower and it has an LED light so you can really get an accurate and precise trim. Excellent. Sounds great. What's the battery like? 90 minutes. So you can do your whole area in about seven recharges. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to manscaped.com and you'll get 20% off with free shipping. Just use our code, which is of course, trigger20. That is trigger20. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use our code, which is of course, Tricker20. Your werewolves will thank you. Excellent. We've got a little bit of time left and you, you talk about New York and the United States and some of the things that have been happening there, including the uh, certainly a wave of reporting about anti-Asian hate crime. I don't know uh, how accurate, tell us, is it? has there been a massive increase or is it just something that uh, people have been focusing on uh, more than before. So, you know, there's been an increase in violent crime all across the board in America. Um, in some cities, it's really stark. I think in Portland, it's been a 1,600% increase in violent wow. crime. Well, they're reimagining public safety, aren't they? So that's good. Oh, they are. And, and <laughs> yeah. the police, right, which is related. Um, and, you know, the 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 data on, on anti-Asian crime or, or, you know, the, the sort of like what we're observing, the, the discourse is based on three sources. One of them is just these social media videos that keep popping up, which are terrible and heartbreaking. You know, we're seeing these like elderly Asians kind of being mugged, being assaulted on the streets, usually in urban centers like um, San Francisco or Los Angeles. Um, and, and they kind of go viral, right? Um, the other, the other two sources, one of which is a, an interesting group called Stop AAPI Hate, which really showed up at the beginning of 2020. Um, and, and their statistics were thrown around in a way that made it seem really stark. Um, there's been a 3,600% increase in, in Asian hate crimes, uh, which sounds terrible. And, if, it, you know, if that were true, would, would just really warrant some sort of uh, severe intervention. But if you look at um, how they collected their data, it's very suspect. Uh, they are based on a completely self-reporting online portal. Um, and, and many of the incidents that are collected are not, don't even meet the threshold of what you would call a crime. Some of them are verbal shunning. Some of them are, you know, simply 
I didn't like the way this person looked at me at, at the supermarket. So it's all based on, on, on self-reporting. And then the third one, which, which came out, I think it was one of the University of, of California was uh, compiled uh, sort of early 2020 crime data, looked at, you know, hate crime reporting by, by the FBI um, in 16 cities across the United States and found that there's been a 150 percent increase. That, for me, is the more relevant data um, out of all of these. And because that is actually based on FBI statistics um, and it's it's preliminary data. We, we don't really get all of 2020's data till November of 2021. So we're still kind of early, but this is preliminary and, and they've compiled it. Again, this is from 16 progressive, most of them progressive run cities in the states. And th- it does look like there's an upswing. Um but numbers of, of Asian crimes are actually very low in absolute numbers. So if you look at New York City, for example, in 2019, there were three anti-Asian hate incidents, three. Um, in 2020, there were 28. So the, the percent increase from Massive. three to 28 is actually really high. But to put that number into sharp relief um, for, for anti-Semitic hate crimes, uh, that there is more than 150 just in New York. So... The narrative about anti-Asian hate crimes, I think, is it seems like something is happening. We're seeing these videos. Um, is this meaningful in a way that is this due to racial prejudice, explicit racial animus? Or is this part of, you know, kind of Asians being part of this um, urban environment, elderly especially, being a very vulnerable population? They know they probably keep their cash underneath the mattresses. They're not using banking system. They live in Chinatowns. They're weak. They won't fight back. They don't own guns. Um, How much of this is opportunistic crime that's part of the ambient crime levels that are heightened anyway, um, all across the board? How much of it is actually racially targeted? And uh, I think his name is Charles Lehman had done, he's uh, with the Manhattan Institute, has done some interesting time series. So he took that data that I, the, the last data set that I described, the FBI data, and he looked at, um, he plotted that over time. And so what you're seeing is, is an interesting spike in March of 2020, just a little tiny spike, which could be attributed to things like the lockdowns and, and um, you know, just kind of the COVID-19 related kind of crimes, potentially. That was in, in 2020. But in 2021, when Biden is president in Democratic run cities, there has been another spike in March 2021. And so the idea that this is somehow due to white supremacy, as the media has ran with this narrative, is completely ridiculous because Trump is not even on social media. No one is out there spouting Wuhan flu or, you know, Wu flu or or China virus. And the idea that this is related to some sort of rhetoric is just completely bollocks. But you can make some interesting inferences. Why is there a spike again in, in and it's pretty significant in, in March of 2021? Now, if you correlate this with Google searches, with media reporting, could it be copycat crimes? Could it be that just awareness of the crime itself makes people report the hate incidents or the hate crimes um, in a way that you know they, they just wouldn't have before? So there are a lot of reasons why potentially, you know, there is this weird spike in March. Um, of 2021, but but we don't really know. But it's certainly we can say that it has nothing to do with the the leading media narrative, which is apparently white supremacy. Well, for a start, <laughs> quite a lot of the people that are committing these crimes don't seem to be white. Um, so, <laughs> or some voters. Or, or, or exactly. Uh, but do you think there's an element in terms of the way it's talked about and the way that it's covered, where it's like? You know, once you introduce identity politics, then it becomes in the interest of every single group to become the victim. And so when Jews get, and you know, I'm allowed to say this because I'm from a Jewish background, you'd be allowed to say this because you're from an Asian background, like everyone would benefit from being in the victim group because that's what society currently values and ranks higher than than non-victim groups. Do you think a large part of it is like, well, people are attacking us, let's, you know, let's make hay. Yeah, it's interesting because you're right. I I, I do agree with the sort of like the victimhood kind of correlating, victim status correlating with moral status somehow in in this society that we live in that, you know, has married intersectionality with with critical race theory. Um, But but Asians in a way are are kind of like I call it Schrodinger's white people because 
you know, you're white sometimes when it comes to um, when it comes to college admissions. And right. so mm. or even like um, if you if you well, you're, for college admissions, you're worse than white. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's is that possible? Yeah, it is possible. Just for, <laughs> just in that one context. Well, and, and even like uh, wages. So if you look at uh, you know income levels, Asians as a group are actually have out earned whites as a demographic in in recent years. So um, you know under those circumstances, Asians are considered whites and therefore have to be adjusted. Their populations, you know, they're overrepresented because and and they're white. So. There, you know, either you have to abolish the the test or or do something in a way to lessen their their uh, demographic numbers in schools or at the workplace. But on the other hand, you know, there are suddenly people of color when it comes to street violence, when it comes to um, you know this uh, invisibility on TV or, or whatever other sort of cultural elite causes that are being supported right now. And and so you see this like weird bifurcation. And the cynic in me has always been. Well, you know, the uh, they know that the AAPI group, the Asian American Pacific Island group, which is another ridiculous bureaucratic racial category that was invented, um, is a useful voting block. And right now it's a pawn in this political game because as CRT and sort of uh, this this narrative about about um, discrimination in college becomes more more obvious to, to Asians, they're going to rebel against that and and tend to vote conservative. And so the only way you're going to bring them back into the progressive fold is is to drum up this narrative that they are targeted, that they are victimized because of their race. Um, that is my guess about the dynamics that are going on politically. Um, and so in a way, you know. Asian sort of uh, elderly suffering, you know, on the streets um, has has become a useful way to kind of milk this issue politically when solving this issue is really just a matter of solving crime. If right. you prosecute it, if if we, you know, uh, provided mental health facilities for many of these people who are attacking these Asians are actually mentally ill. But, you know, our homelessness problem has skyrocketed. Because of the um, because of the lockdowns, crime has skyrocketed, and and we're not solving the very thing that could actually help these people. You know, we're 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 blaming it on on this entirely different um, reason, which is, you know, if you get the 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 reasoning wrong, the root cause wrong, you're going to get the policy wrong and the prescription wrong, and it's not going to do anything. So that's kind of where my frustration is right now. And. Do, are people still thinking defund the police is a good idea? Or have we all accepted that that was a crap idea brought on by the insanity of a lockdown? Actually, it looks like a uh, tide has been turning. And even among African Americans, you know, uh, the, the ones who actually live in these at risk neighborhoods, um, the tide is turning. People, there is such strong data that shows that, you know, stronger policing actually correlates with lower crime. Really? Wow. And, and um, you know, Shocking. even someone like Andrew Yang has been kind of um, criticized a lot by sort of Asian activists, you know, the kinds who went to Ivy Leagues, um, for, for suggesting, for merely suggesting that one of the solutions to prevent, to stop AAPI hate is to increase funding for the police and, and put more police resources in these neighborhoods. And, you know, it, it's just so funny how these narratives shake out because he's been targeted. He, you know, hit pieces were written against him for even suggesting that because because somehow these Asian activists are very aligned with the BLM narrative about, you know, how police actually brutalize uh, communities of color and that we must stand with them. And if we don't stand with black lives, we don't stand with Asian lives, which, again, is trying to connect these causes. And And, you know, as the Palestine conflict kind of erupted as well, you start to see how George Floyd now intersects with Palestine when obviously has nothing to do with each other, right? So we, we live in a time of like globalization of narratives in a way where every struggle has to be connected to some original struggle and, and everything is collectivized and we're not evaluating things independently. And that's such a, a good point. And it's a fantastic place to end the interview. Uh, Melissa, if people want to find you online, where is the best place to do that? Only fans. No, <laughs> that is how we will lead this interview, no, no, and it is going to get a million that. views. So Do you know what? There's probably about six losers on the internet who saw that went great, wasn't? 
Um, the, well, the best way to find me is um, on Twitter, which is mm-hmm. my handle at Miss M S Mel M E L Chen C H E N, um, or you can read my stuff in um, on the Spectator USA website. Um, that's probably the best way to find me. And before we let you go, we have one uh, proper question for you, and then we'll do some locals only questions as well. So, as you know, our last question for the main interview itself is: uh, What is the one thing that we're not talking about that we still should be talking about? We're one of the things that interests me that I don't see much um, discourse on is how is it, how did it come to be that, um, you know, a, a system like in the U.S. where where we have a, a so-called a, a free society that's kind of more in line with the, a brave new world kind of utopia where, you know, we, we optimize for, for pleasure and, and sort of hedonism um and 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 try to you know downregulate pain and discomfort um and how this system the brave new world system in the US and in the west in general in Europe um compared to the totalitarian 1984 China system how these two different systems actually end up converging to look like the same thing where we now because of safetyism and and the you know of harm avoidance um, and not wanting to confront anything um, that that makes us feel bad has led us down a weirdly totalitarian path that, you know, our systems kind of end up feeling, you know, we, we have Yelp, for example, review systems that, that um, you know, are, are, are steps removed from China's social credit system, but not unlike it. And, you know, so I, I find that convergence interesting that we have top-down top down versus uh, bottom up kind of freedom but or control but they're meeting in the same place and and it feels like we're still living in dystopia and it feels inevitable as well i think to me mm. uh but the, the, it's, a, it's a very good point and something that i think is going to come into sharper and sharper focus over the years to come uh which is when we will have you back to talk about it some more melissa thank you so much for mm. chatting with us thank you cheers And thank you guys for watching at home. We will see you very soon with another brilliant interview like this one or Raw Show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. Take care and see you soon, guys. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our Locals community using the link below.